Hey guys, a lot of you have been asking me to do a watercolor guide for beginners. So this video will be about the basic materials and fundamental techniques. But I will also be working on more in-depth guides and tutorials where we will take a closer look at um, all aspects regarding watercolor. But for now, let's have an overview. First, we are going to have a look at watercolor paper. There are a lot of different brands out there. But regardless of that, what you really should keep an eye on are texture, weight and if it's glued or not. The texture of the paper is a very important choice you have to make yourself. This decision will have an impact on the look of your painting from the beginning until the very end. And it obviously can't be changed afterwards. You can find paper with a more natural grain, with mechanical grain which sometimes looks almost like honeycombs, and there is paper with almost no texture at all. In the end, it's mostly about taste. I prefer paper with natural texture or almost no texture at all when it comes to portraits. Unless you have a reason not to, I would recommend starting out with 300 gram paper. Thicker paper will be more durable and stronger, while thinner paper is more likely to tear and to warp. Whatever you do, don't even think about using regular printer paper for your watercolor work. You'll have a bad time if you do. You can acquire single sheets of watercolor paper, which you would have to tape down yourself with special masking tape or something similar. You would do this to keep the paper from warping too much. You can tape the paper down on a board or, like I do, on the table. However, most common watercolor paper comes in blocks, where it is often already glued on the edges, so the paper will still be even after painting. To start painting we need watercolor, of course. Watercolor comes in a lot of different ways. You might have seen the classic solid colors in pans, but you can also get them in tubes. Within one brand the content is usually the same, no matter if you get pans or tubes. Since quality-wise there's no difference, it begs the question, why would you prefer one to the other? The colors in tubes are liquid, which makes it easier to pre-mix a large amount of paint. This is a lot harder with the pens. Tube colors are typically used with plastic pellets or something similar. Once they dry down, you can reactivate them with a wet brush and use them just like the colors in pens. To me, the benefit of working with pens is that you can easily reorder the position of each color and quickly compose your own palettes. It also makes them a little easier to transport them in those boxes. Over the years, I simply got used to working with colors and pens. So just because I use pens, that doesn't mean there's anything inherently inferior to the colors and tubes. I guess it's really up to your workflow and what's more convenient for you. When you're starting out, I would recommend getting student grade watercolors. At this point, investing in artist grade watercolors might be too expensive for you. Unless of course money is not a problem. Just try to keep your fingers away from scholastic watercolors, which for your German viewers are Wasserfarben. To give you an example, I brought something from elementary school. Those colors are not really supposed to perform great and as you can see, they are often dull and streaky. In general, they rarely handle the way proper watercolor would do. You might have seen some watercolors that come in bottles. Those are watercolor inks to be more precise and they use dyes rather than pigments. Often they are highly concentrated and because these colors are transparent like glass, their saturation and brightness is hard to beat. You can even achieve fluorescent neon tones with some of them. Normally you would use them with a pipette and dilute them with water before use, so you can decide whether you want darker or lighter tones. Compared to regular watercolors, these inks achieve a much brighter range, but since they are not light fast, they are not permanent unless displayed the right way. Also I have to say, using them for years now, they are much less forgiving than regular watercolors, so be careful with them. But when to use them? Personally, I really like the combination of both media. Using burning bright tones every once in a while is a fantastic way to achieve impressive contrasts. Simply adding one or two highly saturated colors to the other more muted tones can do the trick. 
Whether you are using inks for the eyes or other areas for example, just make sure to not overdo it. In this picture I use inks for the skin color and you can definitely tell that this guy is orange. So use them sparingly so your whole picture has a harmonic amount of bright colors. The sheer opposite to inks would probably be gouache. Used with enough water they blend really well and overall behave just like watercolors. They can work perfectly as an addition to your regular set of watercolors. The benefit is that those colors which are often mixed with white are highly covering. This means that you can still change things in your painting or correct mistakes afterwards. Using gouache on its own, the white is very strong and you don't have to depend on the white of the paper as your lightest tone. You can also work on cardboard or other toned paper. On the other hand, this often makes the painting appear a bit more dull and milky compared to watercolor, but more on that in another video. Now for the technique. You basically have two options with watercolor, wet and wet or wet and dry. First we start with the wet and wet technique. As the name suggests, I take a good amount of water and spread it on the paper. Once the paper is evenly covered, we can start with colors. The yellow and violet will bleed on the paper, creating beautiful smooth gradients and effects. If needed, try to only push the color to move it. Otherwise, the colors will get mixed and it will appear dirty. For the dry technique, we will work on a dry surface. Take a brush with some water and start drawing. When the color dries down, it will have the beautiful characteristic sharp edges that are typical for watercolor. But the magic happens when you combine those two techniques. Let's go back to the first example where we used the wet technique. After it has dried down, we can use the wet on dry technique and draw the tree on the dry surface to create the illusion of depth of field. If we try that on the other example, we'll see that it won't work that well. The water will blur the sharp lines we did previously and all colors bleed together, giving off a dirty appearance. So keep in mind to always do the soft wet and wet technique first before you start drawing on the dry paper later on, or you would risk smudging or blurring your work. Applied to a portrait, this means that we have to do the basic skin tones first before drawing details like lips or lashes. For that we need to wet the whole face area first and place color where the darkest parts would be. Typically that's under the nose, chin and cheeks. It's important to know, watercolor is a medium that you can only go light to dark with. So it's okay to paint over the lines when they are going to be darker areas afterwards that would cover those mistakes. Hair is a good example where that's the case. Once the skin tone has dried down and we are completely satisfied with it, we can continue working. It's time to paint the things that should keep a sharp shape and for that we need to work on wet on dry. Just like in the previous example, we start drawing on the color, but instead of a tree, we now paint the lips and eyebrows as well as the nostrils, pupils and lashes, using darker colors. These details would bleed and mix in with the skin if we would have done them in the first go, so make sure to paint them only once the paper has dried. Next we start working on the hair. Just like before, we want a nice soft gradient for the base so we can draw darker single strands on it afterwards. 
Wet the area first and fill it with color. When it right down, draw the shadows. Because we want the hair to be soft, we need to blend the strands with the rest at certain areas. To do that, take some water and blend the color. Sometimes you might also need to push some color away, that you can take off the brush with the tissue. Getting the shadows right might seem a bit difficult in the beginning, but with experience you will get better. You can also use photographs and other pictures as reference if you want to. Anyway, as soon as everything is dry again, we can start drawing with the brush again. We can add lines or other details with white paint, or we could use pencils, fine liners or anything you want. When it comes to painting with watercolors, you should be able to choose the right technique at the right time. To tell whether your paper should be wet or dry when applying paint is probably the most important ability when working with watercolors. And to do that, you first have to realize that regardless of colors, a fundamental element of an image are edges. Soft gradients and blurred edges need to be painted first, while sharp lines and shapes can be applied afterwards. Alright, that's it for the overview. I hope I could give you a good perspective on the most fundamental aspects of watercolor. Let me know in the comments what you want to see next. As I said, this is only the start of a series of guides and tutorials. You can shape the upcoming videos by telling me what you want to learn about or what you have trouble with. Also, hit the like button if you enjoyed this video and share it with your friends who are interested in watercolors. If you are new to my channel, don't forget to subscribe so you can watch my future tutorials as soon as they come out. You can find more videos right here or here somewhere. Maybe it's um, a new tutorial, maybe it's a watercolor speed paint, maybe it's something realistic or something more manga-ish. You will find out. <laughs>